Good evening, and welcome to the very first ever Crossroads of Ideas. You can say you were here when it all started. Thanks so much, yeah. Um, sorry that we ran out of seats. Actually, we shouldn't be surprised given uh, our speaker and, and the topic that she's going to address. Um, there's room on the floor up front, and we're putting out some more chairs if we can, but uh, try and crowd around if you can, and nobody will mind if you sit on the floor. It's pretty comfortable. Uh, my name is Laura Heisler. I'm the Director of Programming for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, or WARF, one of the three partners that live in this building, in the Discovery Building. And uh, one of the visions we had when we were putting this building together, and we had conversations with a, a group of people about as big as the, this group in this room, from across the community and across the campus, and we talked about how to make this building more than just an amazing place for researchers to do their science. How do we make it? Actually, we use the phrase a crossroads of ideas. And so, how many of you have been here before? Has anybody not been here before? <laughs> okay, a few of you. Um, some of you raised your hands, but I know better. Um, if you've been here like at lunchtime, you won't be surprised to know that one of the models for this building was actually Grand Central Station in New York City. So the architects really wanted this to be a place that you could run into people, not necessarily literally, but cross paths with people from all walks of life, all disciplines across campus, all kinds of professions throughout the day, evening, weekend, et cetera. And so they designed a lot of architectural elements to make that possible. So when you're in the building, you'll notice there's no back door. There's actually five entrances. They're all equally inviting. There are lots of places to get things to eat, and there's usually a lot going on. So, um, so, so far, so good. It really has become a bit of a crossroads. But one thing that we hadn't done was really invite the community in to be a part of shaping some of the things that we address in topics and in conversations. And that's what we want this series to be, truly a crossroads where we have a dialogue between campus and community about the issues of the day. And that's one of the goals of this series, the Crossroads of Ideas. And it truly is a partnership between all three building partners, so between WARF and the Mortgage Institute for Research and the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, the two research institutes that also live in this building. So I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping with you about what we're planning on doing and then how you can be a part of it. And then I will turn things over to Brad Schwartz, who's the CEO of the Mortgage Institute, to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, so I mentioned that we're going to address a variety of topics. We won't, we won't be afraid to talk about science, but we also want to talk about things that matter to all of us in the course of doing our, doing our work, living our lives. And we're going to connect all of those things with research going on at UW. These topics are going to evolve over time, and this is really where you come in, because we're going to want to ask you what you thought about what you just experienced and what you would like to see. But in order to do that, you're going to have to be in touch with us. So let me just say a little bit about what's coming up to, to whet your appetite and then tell you how you can be in touch with us. Um, I do want to note that this series will take place on the first Tuesday of the month. Um, we are not going to do one the, in January because that's just too early in the year, but the first Tuesday of the month, so you can look for that. We will promote, as we have so far, in Isthmus, but we would very much like to be able to be more targeted and reach out to you directly. Um, the next two topics have already been decided, but after that, it's sort of a blank slate, and that's where we want to enter into a dialogue with you and with the campus. So on November 3rd, Cecilia Klingley from the Law School will be talking about criminal justice reform. And on December 1st, Alfonso Morales from Urban and Regional Planning in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences will be talking about the importance of street markets. So these are things that we're all living with all the time. So hopefully these topics whet your appetite, and hopefully you'd like to be a part of the conversation with us. So how do you do that? We have a number of tried and true methods to do that that span the gamut of the technology we have available to us. So you can text us. Um, you can do it right now. You can text WARF, followed by your email address, to 22333. We'll put this back up at the end as well. Um, or you can go on our website and navigate around and find something somewhere that says contact us <laughs> and send us your email and let us know. Or you can use first century technology and write your name on one of the lists outside the door. Or 19th century technology and leave your calling card, your business card in the box. So whatever suits you, please let us know how to find you. And then we'll be in that dialogue and we'll be talking with you about your experiences and what you might be interested in hearing. So with that, um, I think I'm done with the housekeeping. I'd like to invite Brad Schwartz to introduce tonight's speaker.
Thank you, Laura. Welcome, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce Kathy Kramer, uh, tonight's speaker. And before I tell you about her, I want to uh, reiterate a couple of the things that Laura pointed out. The purpose of this building is really to help bring people together and ideas together. We talk about that a lot within this building, and most people think about it in terms of scholarly collaboration. And since the research institutes here are scientific institutes, people talk about collaboration in science. But in fact, interaction with one another is a way to keep the university itself strong. And that's more important in the big picture than just collaborating on experiments. It's breaking down barriers between the way that different disciplines may think about things to serve our society more fully and more effectively. And I think when we talk about interdisciplinary conversations, we tend to think, we tend to keep our heads in the academy. But in fact, in today's world, where our society has begun questioning the value of research universities, I think we have to remember that it wasn't that long ago that the value of research universities was unquestioned. And I think reinvigorating that tie with our society is really, really important. And And as part of that, I think we should remember that we're all part of the same community. And to whatever the degree that we can uh, strengthen those communal ties among ourselves, we will become more effective in uh, communicating and uh, working well with our supporting society. So with that, I want to tell you about today's speaker, who is truly a leader in helping us do this and helping us understand our society. Uh, Kathy Kramer uh, got her bachelor's degree here at the University of Wisconsin. She earned her PhD degree at the University of Michigan. And then like many of us, she came back home. She is now a professor uh, in the Department of Political Science. And I have to check my list because she uh, is so active in so many different areas of intellectual activity that her membership I could take up the rest of the hour telling you what her membership is, but she's an affiliate in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, the La Follette School of Public Affairs, the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology, the Wisconsin Center uh, for the Advancement of Post-Secondary Education, and the Center for Nonprofits. And I will tell you that probably the uh, appointment that summarizes her activities best is that she is the director of the Mortgage Center for Public Service. And she really focuses on the service component of that. And as somebody who has benefited from knowing her and uh, um, her perspective on how important public service is, she has been a leader in bringing faculty members together from across campus and helping us understand ways in which we can engage with the society that supports us and become more effective as a research university. And so with that, I am happy to present to you Kathy Kramer uh, so she can uh, tell us about some of her most recent scholarship. Kathy. So I have many people to thank tonight and I want to start off with Laura and Brad. So Laura Heisler really is a gem in this community in the way she has transformed the first floor of this building into a truly public space. And I, yes, it's really, and one of the joys of my job of directing the Mortgage Center for Public Service has been getting to know Laura and working with her. So thank you for inviting me to kick off this series. I'm very honored to be with you all and share my thoughts and hear your thoughts in turn. And I also want to thank Brad because also through my position at the Mortgage Center for Public Service, I got to know Brad, who is truly uh, a mentor to me and an inspiration to me in terms of a person who so strongly believes that the purpose of a great public university is to pursue and promote the public good. So this building is in great hands, let me tell you. Um, thank you both. 
I also, yes, thank you. I am also very honored tonight to have in the audience my parents, Pat and Kip Kramer, who are sitting side by side of my little daughter, who will not know I'm talking about her because she's listening to Batman on earphones. But um, Pat and Kip Kramer are joining us this evening. Um, they still live in my hometown, Grafton, as well as my godparents, Bob and Carol Holmes from New Glarus and their daughter, Leanne and my surrogate aunt and uncle, Gil and Harriet Edelstein from Evanston. So um, you are with the Kramer family today. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, now I'm going to turn to more sobering topics. And whoops, Can, I'm, I'm just not sure I'm doing, doing this right. Do I have to push it? Or should I just, yeah, or should I just do this? Okay, sorry, I'm gonna use, what would you call this? 20th century, 20th century technology. I'm just gonna use the arrows, okay. So I wanna start with a fact. Economic inequality has been increasing at a pretty drastic rate since the 1970s. Each of these graphs I'm gonna show you was not created by me, but by different researchers. To be honest, I just pulled these off the web. You Google economic inequality, and there's more than enough evidence to tell you that the wealthiest amongst us, their income levels have increased at a pretty high rate since the 70s. And for the rest of us, and I mean the bottom 90%, bottom 99%, bottom 75%, however you want to slice it, our income levels have pretty much been stagnant. We know this. We know this in a variety of ways. It's been pretty well documented. There's another thing I want to tell you that's probably less well known, that's um, more commonly starting to be understood among political scientists. And that is that when you look at our national or federal policymakers, our senators in particular, um, the way that they respond to the preferences of the public, it looks as though they're responding to the preferences of the very wealthiest amongst us, not those in the bottom tiers of, of income. Here's what I mean. This is a study done by a good friend of mine, Larry Bartels, who's now a professor at Vanderbilt University. He was at Princeton University for a long time. And you can see at the top of the title the name of his most recent book on unequal democracy. You may have heard of this book. It's been out a while now, since 2008. But what this chart is showing you is um, he's looking at three different Congresses. The 101st Congress is the Congress that was in office from 1989 to 1991. And each of these. Um, three different bars is looking at a different Congress, and what this chart is just simply showing you is the level of responsiveness that he calculated statistically between senators' constituents and senators' behavior in terms of the votes they cast. And it looks like from these bars that senators in these three Congresses, at least, were most responsive to high income earners. And you might say, well, but maybe that's one party or another. Well, unfortunately, no. Here's breaking it down by Democrats and Republicans. Democrats, like Republicans, look much more responsive to high or middle income earners than they do to low income earners. The question I'm stuck with is, what's going on here? But also, why is it the case that if economic inequality is increasing at such a drastic rate, and our politicians don't seem to be responding to anyone but the wealthiest amongst us, why is it that there's so little support in the public for redistribution? Why is that? One answer could be people are stupid. Right? How many times have you heard people say that, right? How can people vote against their interests? Why do they do that? Well. If you carry that out a little bit farther, what you're saying is the average American is incapable of participating in democracy. And I hope that is not the case. But I'm here to tell you more about my, than about my hopes. I'm here to question this assumption and to instead ask what's going on? How are people understanding their political world? Um, why are they casting their votes the way they do? I'm a public opinion scholar, but I'm a little bit unusual in that uh, most of the time, public opinion scholars 
study people through doing telephone surveys or face-to-face -face surveys. They take a large sample of a population and try and assess what people's preferences are, whether they're talking about votes or where they stand on an issue and gather a variety of other characteristics to try to understand statistically why it is that people vote the way they do. I've always been fascinated in a slightly different question, and that is not what are people's preferences and how do we predict them, but how do people understand politics? How do they understand their world? And so what I have done over the course of my career is invite myself into conversations, and which is what I'll be telling you about tonight. The question that's driving me, um, sorry, is, I'm going to pass by that for a moment. The question that's driving me is um, not what are people getting wrong or what is wrong with people, but instead, how do people understand their world? How do they understand the world, including the political world that they live in? So you know a little bit about my family because you're sitting with them, but I want to start off telling you just a little bit more about me so that you know where, you're, where I'm coming from. You can probably tell, at least from Brad's comments, that I'm a proud alumna from this great university, and probably already from my accent that I'm from this place. I'm from Wisconsin. It's a little known secret that I wasn't actually born here, but we're just going to move past that. I moved here when I was four and a half, and I grew up here in Grafton, Wisconsin. My mom was the very first female member of the village board uh, about the time I went to college, so not that long ago. Um, and my dad is the legendary high school football coach, Kip Kramer. So if you haven't had a chance to meet him, you may have seen his plaque hanging in the uh, uh, high, school football, fo high School Football Hall of Fame in Camp Randall. Um, but I, clearly, I love this place. Uh, hopefully you can tell that already. And so when I earned tenure in 2006, I thought to myself, OK, what research project can I devise that will get me out into the state of Wisconsin and give me time with the people of this state? And so that's really, honestly, where this project started. I wanted to travel to as many places as I could around the state and sit down with people and listen to them, listen to what um, they were interested in, what concerned them. And specifically for my political science self, I was interested in how social class identity influenced the way they talked about politics. There were several other reasons I went around the state doing this work. One was that at the time, I was also helping to direct the Badger Poll, which is a project that our survey center used to do here, a statewide public opinion poll. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to generate the topics for that poll by asking the people of the state what they're concerned about, as opposed to just asking our friends in Madison. Another reason I went around the state is that when I asked the university for funding to do this through a, a Baldwin Wisconsin Idea Endowment Grant, um, they said, sure, as long as while you're out there, you ask about us. We want to know what people are thinking about the university. So I embarked on a study in which I sampled a bunch of places around the state. I carved up the state into different regions depending on political leanings, type of industry, type of agriculture, population density, different demographics. And these are the 27 communities I ended up with. When I sampled a community, I called up at the extension office in the county in which that community fell, or the local newspaper editor, and I said, where in such and such Wisconsin can I go to sit down with people and, and listen to them talk and ask a few questions. And so they pointed me to places like this and a variety of other places that you're going to see in a few moments. They pointed me to gas stations, to cafes, to diners, to churches. And so what I did was to travel to these places. At the time, I knew that a group of regulars was meeting. I'd walk in and I'd say, hi, I'm Kathy from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, do you mind if I join you this morning? <laughs> and they would laugh, like a few of you are, and I would sit down and say, I, I'm genuinely interested in what you think. I'm a public opinion researcher from Wisconsin-Madison, and I really just want to spend some time with you, ask some questions, and here's a post-it note or a football schedule or a pen as a token of my appreciation. Here's my business card so you can contact me if you're concerned about this or you have more questions. Um, and do you mind if I turn on my recorder? And no, no, that's fine, that's fine. And people um, had a lot to say. Oftentimes, I mean, almost the time my question, my very first question was, what are the big concerns in your community? And I had other questions that followed. Um, 
but people had more than enough to fill the time that we could spend together. And so in each of those 27 communities overall, there were 39 groups that I visited over about a five year time span. I went to most of them two times, uh, at least all of them at least twice, um, and some of them as many as five or six times. And I wasn't planning to be doing this study that long, but when Scott Walker became governor in 2010, as you all know, Wisconsin politics became very, very interesting, and I couldn't resist continuing to listen to what people had to say. So I went out there looking to spend some time with the people of Wisconsin, right? And I went out there looking for the way social class identity mattered for the way people talked about politics. But what I heard was something unexpected, something that surprised me, and it was a significant divide between rural and urban areas in Wisconsin. Primarily, I had sampled a variety of small communities, rural communities, and in those places, I heard a lot of resentment toward the cities, um, which again, surprised me. Here's what I mean. There's a mental map out there of the state of Wisconsin in which Madison and Milwaukee are of a piece, and then there's the rest of the state. Let me show you the state map again. You're all familiar with it, but it's worthwhile to notice that Madison and Milwaukee, the two main metro areas of the state, are kind of down in the corner by themselves, and there's a lot of other geography out there. It's a big state with a lot of area, and many people, sometimes they refer to Madison and Milwaukee as the M&Ms, right? And sometimes people bristle when they hear the term outstate, but there is definitely a sense that there are the cities and then there's the rest of the state. Now, mind you, I'm fully aware that there are medium-sized cities around the state, but even there, whether we're talking La Crosse or Eau Claire or Green Bay, there's still a sense that power and, and resources and respect are focuses, focused on Madison and Milwaukee. I want to say a little bit more about each of those things in turn. For one, when people talk about Madison in many small communities, or at least the groups of people that I found myself with, Oftentimes they talk about Madison and be referring to the state legislature and the university together, which again was a surprise for me. Um, I'll leave it at that. But then here's the story about, or the perception of how resources flow in the state. There's a sense that Madison brings in all the taxpayer dollars. There were some other words used, that, well, I guess I use it in my PowerPoint, sucks in all the taxpayer dollars. Um, and then um, spends it either on itself or Milwaukee, and that um, many communities feel as though they don't see that, that money in return. We can talk more about that in the Q&A if you wanna see hard data on that. Um, but then this, this other thing I have, I have up here, power emanates from Madison and not from reverse, is this concern that all of the decisions that govern my life, I'm speaking now as a rural person or a person in a small town, all the decisions that govern my life are made in Madison and Milwaukee and communicated out to me. And there isn't listening going on in reverse. I heard this very often with respect to the DNR, that the regulations that run the DNR are decisions made in Madison and not in the communities in which people um, are interacting themselves with um, rural or wildlife. One other element I wanna explain here is that it's not just about power, um, or about resources, but also this sense that, you know, city people just don't get us. They don't understand the rural way of life and the way we live. And probably the best way to convey that to you is to give it to you in, in their words themselves. So I'm going to read to you two very brief excerpts from some of the conversations that I took part in. This uh, excerpt I'm going to read to you is from a group of women that met every Tuesday morning in the in back of a restaurant in a far northwestern resort town and they'd get together some some of them were still working some of them were retired um, and they welcomed me in I found them through uh, a friend of a friend of a friend of an extension agent <laughs> so um, that all the names I'm going to use as I as I share conversations with you are made up just to protect their protect their identities but Teresa said to me or I, I'm explain I'm asking them about the university and Teresa as a former public school teacher, and she's saying to me how she perceived that University of Wisconsin-Madison did not respect um, her part of the state and didn't respect the students that came from her school. So she says to me, as a former educator, I resented highly comments such as, 
There is no education north of Highway 8. Highway 8 is for the kind of across the northern third of the state, east to west. Um, there's no education north of Highway 8. These kids aren't, and we send them such absolutely excellent and well-prepared students. The idea that we're the hick area of the state, it was painful. And I'm a little flabbergasted, and I say, so where did you get that from, recruiters? And she said, professors. And I said, really, when they would visit with you? And she said, yeah, or publish in newspaper articles or other, you know, and that was a little distressful because I think Northern Wisconsin feels a little far away from Madison anyway. We keep waving our hands and saying, yoo-hoo, there's another half of the state up here. Up north is not Wausau. And I have to tell you, when she said that line, I thought, oh my gosh, all the times I went up north with my family, we get to Wausau, stop for ice cream, we're up north. <laughs> yeah, I've always thought of Wausau as up north. I'm sorry, I, got, as I realize I got it wrong, but. Um, here's the other conversation. This is another group of people that met weekly, and um, oh dear, I'm hoping I can, it's okay, I have it on paper. Um, this is a group of women who, I'm sorry, this is a group of people who met weekly in the basement of a church, because in this town, um, the town was one of these um, beautiful, tiny places where it basically consists of the church and a smattering of houses. And um, um, the, church is, the church basement is the only public place to meet, you know? So they meet, it's some farmers, some stay-at-home moms, some retirees, some people who are working nearby and just take a little time off every Tuesday mid-morning to come and be a part of this group. And I'm asking them, again, I'm asking about the university, and so I say, what do you think the University of Wisconsin-Madison does not do well? When you think about it, and Martha says, represents our area. I, and I forgot to say, this is in sort of the northwest, central northwest part of the state. Martha says, represents our area. I mean, we are like, we're strange to Madison. They want us to do everything for Madison's laws and the way they do things, but we totally live differently than the city people live. So they need to think more rural instead of all this city area. And Donna says to me, we can't afford to educate our children like they can in the cities. Simple as that. We don't have the advantages. Ethel says, all the things they do based on Madison and Milwaukee, never us. Martha says, yeah, we don't have the advantages that they give their local people there, I think, a lot of times. And it's probably because they don't understand how rural people live and what we deal with in our problems. So this thing I'm describing, this perspective, is what I call rural consciousness. So if you come across that term in my, the title of my book, it's just a social science way of describing this thing that has two main components. One is this identity as a rural person, and then it's intertwined with this strong sense that people in rural Wisconsin are on the short end of the stick in a variety of ways, whether we're talking about power or where resources go or respect. In each of those ways, people are perceiving that they're not getting their fair share. And that's what I mean by distributive injustice here. So you might be asking, I started off with these slides about economic inequality and asked this question about why isn't there more support for redistribution, redistribution of wealth, or even more support for more government programs. And so now I want to try to make that connection with this perception that I'm describing about um, rural identity intertwined with this sense of they're not getting their fair share. Here's what that sounded like to me. I'm going to give you three storylines that were very common in the conversations to give you a flavor for what that, what that sounded like. One is that you know, people said to me, you know, we're not opposed to government spending. We're willing to pay taxes, and we're willing to even increase taxes for certain things, but it's not going to come back to us. So why would we agree to that? Why would we vote in people who are going to raise our taxes and take the money and run to the cities? I heard that a lot with respect to education. So um, for example, um, people would say to me, uh, they would talk about their pride in their local public schools and say, yeah, you know, we, we, we know that we might need to spend a little bit more here in order to give our students the kind of quality education that they get down in the cities. but that money, we're not going to see it. The way educational dollars are distributed in the state is not fair. So that was one storyline. Again, what I'm giving you, you here are perceptions. 
and storylines, they're not necessarily um, supported by data in the way that our education dollars are actually distributed in the state. In the state. Here's another storyline, um, and it has to do with public employees. So the perception I often heard was that as with DNR workers, as with, as with public school workers, um, there's a perception that government is an urban thing. So even if you're a public school teacher and you've lived in a community for 20, 25 years, or you work for the DNR and you live right there with the other community members, that the decisions that govern the way you do your job are urban decisions. So the storyline I heard was, you know, government's this urban thing. Government is clearly not working for us. Would you look around at the community? I had one guy say to me once, he said, would you please just go over to the window and look outside? And as he's trying to describe the way his community is struggling economically, they'd say, clearly, government is not helping small town Wisconsin. So why would we support more of it? So when Act 10 came around, and people, a wide swath of people in the state supported it, this kind of sentiment under, under, was underlying a lot of that. Here's the third storyline I want to give you. And um, it goes like this. Um, and it has to do with public employees. I'll give you an example with respect to public employees first. So <laughs> you're telling me, Kathy, I'm talking about a conversation that was directed at me. So you're telling me that you, your job is to travel around the state <laughs> and invite yourself in to have coffee with a bunch of really nice people like us, and yet you're a professor down there? How does that work? And you, you have a pension, right? Well, yes, I do. And, and health care benefits, right? Yeah. And do you get dental? Yes, I do. Um, people would say to me, look, I am working two jobs, busting my rear, doing manual labor, and you're telling me that I should pay more taxes so that I can pay for your health care? That's how it came across. And mind you, people were very nice as they were saying this. <laughs> but the perception, unfortunately, is that people have an idea of who's deserving in the population and who is not. Sometimes that was directed towards public employees and me in a kind way. And, and, a, lot, and it, a lot of it had to do with the sense of who out there works hard. And the sense that people who take a shower before they go to work, do they really work as hard as those of us who've got a shower when we come home? Right? So a lot of this was about people like me. But some of it had to do with race as well. And as you probably, may, many of you have probably been thinking during my remarks is anti-urban sentiment isn't part of that about race, undoubtedly. Part of it is also about how we think about who is deserving in this population. And our notions of hard work and deservingness are so carefully intertwined that public employees fall in that target group, but as do those groups that we have stereotyped as people who are lazy, right? Who haven't aren't working for what we're giving them, and so I want I do want to raise that and have just acknowledge that that's part of what's going on here. But I also want you to notice that what is going on here is not a bunch of um, I'm going to refrain from using a just perpetuating more stereotypes, but not a bunch of racially ignorant people basing their policy judgments on um, racist sentiments alone. It's interwoven in there, but it's, it's much more complicated. To, to sum up, in a way, um, I want to go back to the question I started with, which is how are people in rural areas understanding redistribution and the appropriate role of government? They're understanding it through resentment. Understanding it through this lens um, of resentment, and there's so many different layers to it, too, right? There's this sense that it's cities and city people resentment toward 
There's resentment toward public employees. There's resentment towards people of color. And it's all in the context of this, right? Well, so what? Maybe these are just conversations. Well, not really, because politicians, savvy politicians, know how to take advantage of these sentiments. So our governor, Scott Walker, I've already mentioned Act 10 a bit, but we know that for all of the energy that was focused at, at, around the Capitol in protest against Act 10, there was roughly just as many people around the state supporting Act 10. And um, Governor Walker has been very successful at tapping into the kind of resentments I'm describing and using other very effective campaign strategies to try to get his way with controversial policies like Act 10. I want to give you some examples of just exactly how um, just exactly how politicians can make use of these types of resentments by using uh, Governor Scott Walker as an example. And here, uh, briefly, what I want to know before I give you those examples is that I'm focused on Wisconsin. My concern is primarily Wisconsin at this point in time, but we are not unique in the way this is working around the state. And in the q and A, I I think we'll have time to talk about the presidential election. You can see it happening in other respects. But for the time being, sorry, um, Wisconsin has been, until very recently, and I would argue, kind of ground zero for these debates about the appropriate role of government. OK, so what does this sound like? Well, it sounds like a high-speed train to me. For example, in 2010, in the gubernatorial primary, in the very first debate, Walker made this statement about the high-speed train that had that uh, Jim Doyle had um, the Jim Doyle administration had successfully applied for the funding to come here to Wisconsin. And um, here's what Walker said: If you look at what Jim Doyle and Tom Barrett have put on the table in spending 810 million on a high-speed train line between Milwaukee and Madison with no assurance that it will go to Eau Claire or La Crosse or anywhere else. It's just about those two areas, Milwaukee and Madison. And it's about taking that money, money that will cost the citizens of Wisconsin up to $10 million per year. According to their numbers, I think it will actually be much more. That's $10 million that doesn't go to fix the road, the road that goes up from West Salem through the cutout up to Black River Falls. It doesn't fix streets in La Crosse. That's money that's taken away from our local roads and our bridges and our other transportation needs today. Here's another example. This is after the successful passage of Act 10, and Governor Walker um, was, is speaking to the American Enterprise Institute. And mind you, you know, when Governor Walker ran for governor, he was county executive of Milwaukee County, right? And so the way he did that successfully was to run against Milwaukee by saying, I took on the machine in Milwaukee, I can do it in Madison. So here's, here's a statement. Um, we were able to rein, he's talking about Act 10 now. We were able to rein in abuses of things like overtime and other excesses out there by no longer having opportunities where, in our case, some of our state employees could literally call in sick on their shift and then come back to work the next shift on overtime, or bus drivers in places like Madison that made $150,000 or more because of overtime. Those things have all changed, and now the power is back in the hands of local officials and ultimately the taxpayers of our state. And so that's ultimately what we did. It seems pretty reasonable when you hear us talk about it. So what I want to flag there is just this statement about bus drivers in places like Madison. Places like Madison, there's two, right? Madison and Milwaukee. So some summary thoughts, and then I am going to try and leave with something a little bit more hopeful and upbeat. So to come back again to this question, are people just voting against their interests? You, st you still may be asking yourself that, and that's okay, but here's my answer to that question. That is, 
pay attention to how sometimes when people make that argument about people voting against their interests, there, there's an argument being made about how they're fooled by other things, like What's the Matter with Kansas, very popular book not that long ago, basically made the argument that people were being distracted by cultural issues, cultural issues like abortion. Perhaps it's because of my gender that I was clearly a social scientist from Madison. Nobody in over 80 conversations, over five years of visits with 39 different groups uh, ever talked with me about abortion. They were concerned about economics through and through. They were considering economic things. So I don't think it's accurate to say that these folks are being distracted by cultural issues. Here's another thing I want to point out. Oftentimes when we try and figure out how people are going to vote, we ask, you know, are they leaning toward the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? I saw almost always conversations, I say I heard conversations in which people were saying, when I would ask point blank, which party do you think best represents the interests of people around here? People, without skipping a beat, almost always would say neither. Neither party represents people like us. And so I think it's worth our while to think about what's pulling people towards certain candidates other than partisanship. What are the things that motivate them? to vote a certain way or support different policies. Um, again, these conceptions of who is working hard and who is deserving and who are the recipients of a policy or who are the perceived recipients of a policy seem to be pretty strong motivators to me. OK, so here's a little bit uplifting sentiment. I do think that if there are alternatives, you might say, well, this is just politics. Politics has always been about us versus them, about creating battle lines of pitting groups of people against one another. Perhaps, but I think it's time that we ask more of our elected officials, that we ask them to justify their policy stances to us on the backs of something other than our fellow citizens make an argument to us about why we ought to support um, certain policies, not because of our resentment towards the recipients of those policies, but because it's actually in the broader public good. The second thing I have up here, this term submerged benefits is kind of a newer term to political science, and it refers to the fact that so many of us receive are recipients of government social programs, and we don't even notice it. They're delivered in such a way that they aren't as obvious as welfare, but we are nonetheless recipients of government social programs. So for example, think to yourself, how many of you take a, a mortgage home interest tax deduction on your taxes? A lot of us. That's a government social program. When we talk about rolling back government, cutting back government, are we thinking about those things? Oftentimes, the, the programs that are more submerged are those that are more likely to be used by wealthier people in the population. Maybe we should think, rethink that. I also would like to encourage us all to ask, when we think that a politician is representing our interests, why do we think that? How do we know that a politician is actually listening? And think back to those bar charts earlier about the senators in the late, late 80s and early 90s. And I forgot to note that there's been subsequent studies showing that the same kind of thing goes on at the state level and it goes on in our national government more recently than the, than the mid 90s. But we need to question whether they're actually listening to us. Finally, two more things. I think it's good to consider the merits of the arguments people in rural areas are making are policies actually meeting their needs. It is the case that we spend a lot of money in rural communities in the state of Wisconsin, both state and federal dollars, but is the way we're spending them actually meeting the concerns of folks there? And also, how much do our urban legislators understand rural concerns and vice versa, right? I've been focusing on rural areas here, small town Wisconsin, but there's another story to be told, right, about the flip side of these perceptions. Finally, I think um, it's time, and it has been time for a long time, to focus on service to other people and lift up the common good. Here at the University of Wisconsin, we are so fortunate to have a whole center dedicated to public service. And yes, I'm making a plug for the Mortgage Center for Public Service, which I direct, but I mean it sincerely. 
that there are people with a vision for how important it is to, in, to encourage our young people from a very early stage to think about someone other than themselves, to think about the broader public good, and to hold up service as a good thing. And I would also say hold up service in government as a good thing. When did it become the case that at serving as a public employee was not a noble calling? Finally, I encourage you all, as you leave tonight, to question, next time you hear people say, God, I wish people weren't so stupid, right, when they're thinking about politics these days. Is it that people are ignorant, or is there something much more profound going on here? OK, now I want to leave you with something that hopefully will make you laugh. This is my very favorite conversation from all of my travels. And bear with me if you've heard me read this before. But one of the places I visited was this fabulous old diner in central Wisconsin. And I was told by a lawyer in town that, well, it took me a while. But finally, he admitted to me, yeah, there's a group of regulars. OK. What you have to do is you have to go into such and such a place and there will be people sitting at the counter. You need to walk past them. You need to walk through the curtain at the back of the room. And there will be a dice game going on. And I said, OK, sounds good. So the first time I went, they politely stopped playing dice for about 45 minutes and talked with me. And then the third time I went, I had brought my coin purse and played for a while. And then the next visit, um, Oh, I forgot one important point, though. At the end of my first visit, so they listened politely to me, and then they said, so do you know how to play ship captain and crew? And I said, <laughs> and my dad's laughing, because I said, oh, yes, I do, <laughs> because my dad taught me early on, and I think <laughs> the whole Kramer clan here knows how to play ship captain and crew. Um, is this dice game where you have uh, five dice and you have your little shaker cup and you get three rolls and you have to roll a six, a five, and a four in that order and then the remaining two dice determine how high your roll is. So I brought my coin purse back and I played and the third time I brought my coin purse back and on that same day, it's early in the morning, there's a horse auction going on in town and so these folks are asking me about the horse auction. Okay. So we're playing dice, we're talking about the horse action. Henry says to me, well, why don't you buy one of them horses? I got a trailer. And I say, well, I, I'm not sure where I would keep them, Henry. And he says, huh? Because at the time, they know I live about a mile out from the football stadium here. And if they come to a game or state wrestling tournament or whatever, and they need a place to park, they can park in my driveway. And so I'm like, Henry, I don't have a place for a horse. And, and Henry says, huh? I said, well, I'm not sure where I would keep him. And Henry says, oh, you keep him in Madison. That's where they keep all the bullshit. <laughs> you know, so it gets better. So, and then he says, well, basically, all you got to do, Kathy, is buy the front end of the horse. They got the back end in Madison. <laughs> so, all right, but here's the problem. We're playing dice, and I keep winning. So, yeah, so here I am studying this phenomenon of people in outstate Wisconsin perceiving that those of us from Madison, we come in, we take their money, we take it back to the cities, and they never see it again. So... I'm pretty uncomfortable, and I'm also thinking, okay, are there IRB things I should be con concerned about, which is the, in the, the review board that you put your projects in front of to make sure that you're treating people decently as you do your research. So yeah, so I'm joking with them to try and kind of ease the, I don't know, make myself feel better, really. Okay, so I say, well, I come and I ask for your thoughts and I take your money. And Richard says, well, I tell you what, that's good though. We have so little of it here. And I say, well, it all goes to Madison anyway, right? And Howard says, we expect nothing less from Madison. And Richard says, well, at least it won't cost any postage to get it down there now. <laughs> so, yes. So. I think it is good to end on a laugh because as sobering as all of this is, I had such a grand time doing this work and meeting these folks and, and getting to know getting to know their thoughts. So I would love to hear your thoughts and questions and please don't feel compelled to ask me a question. If there's something that's on your mind and you just want to say it, please feel free. Thank you.
Okay, so there are microphones and they're gonna pass them around to you. So yes, please wave your hands and, and wait for the mic. So whoever gets the mic next, please just go ahead. Is there resentment in people in, uh, among people in the rural areas about the fact that voucher uh, money, uh, school voucher money is going primarily to private schools in urban areas and it's being sucked out of the budgets of public schools in rural areas? Great question. What I'm able to tell you about is the times when people um, mention those types of concerns to me. I, my data is not so great for saying, you know, how common is the sentiment out there in rural Wisconsin, that, that either pro or anti-vouchers. But I did come across conversations that basically ran exactly along those lines where people would resent that um, some public funds for public education were being uh, devoted to private schools. So I did, I did come across that sometimes. I sure did. Your comment about uh, uh, using the extension service in the various the localities of the state to get entree into the groups that you interacted with uh, makes me uh, curious about what your perception of uh, the extension workers in each of the counties is. And uh, if you got from uh, any of the people that you interacted with, are they identified with the university or the community? Okay, so I, uh, I found very, very positive sentiments towards extension offices and extension educators and extension agents around the state. Oftentimes when I would ask people about the University of Wisconsin-Madison, people would talk about extension to me. That there's you know a little bit of a confusion there, but in a way it, it's, um, it, there, there are important overlaps in the way extension and University of Wisconsin-Madison, the whole system are structured. Um, but the, to kind of get to the second part of your question, um, people, when, People talked about their local system schools when I was in a place with a local system school, and very fondly, much as the way they would talk about uh, UW-Madison, while at the same time wanting to um, be more a part of UW-Madison and wanting um, to feel as though they were more welcomed here and more respected by this institution um, than um, than they than they were currently feeling, and that was the case with people who had an association, an employment, or position at a UW system school, um, other than UW Madison. So that I I found that perception to be pretty widespread. But just to reemphasize how much people um, raved about extension as a positive thing in their community, and partly I think. So much of that comes from the fact that they actually know those fa folks in many counties. They're familiar with them, and they feel as though those folks know their community in turn. Yeah. Kathy, if you think about the work that's been done by your colleague, Barry Barden, from the Political Science Department, and if you think about the work that's been done by Craig Gilbert from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, they've documented over the past 20 years, or maybe even going back 40 years, that the state has become redder in the urban area, excuse me, in the rural areas and has become more blue in the urban areas, right? Yeah, that's true. So with that in mind and with the fact that the legislature has been dominated by Republicans since 2010, and we know they've delivered on things like Act 10, conceal carry, um, looking forward to um, having an ID for other social programs like food stamps, and I could go on. So when you think about the redistribution that you've talked about and the resentment, how do those people feel about the way in which their Republican legislators, because they're primarily Republican legislators in those rural areas, mm -hmm. how are they delivering on securing a better economic future for their citizens? It depended on where I was um, and the legis the people representing that particular part of the state. And mind you, it also depended on who I was talking to. So some folks perceived that their state legislators, in, and I'm thinking you're particularly of people in 
um, outstate Wisconsin, represented by Republicans, that they were being represented well. Other times, people, and probably was more common, if I would go back and count through my field notes, it was more common for people to feel not represented and whether the person was or their legislators were Republicans or Democrats, just have this sense that when people go to Madison, something happens, right? Um, they, they, they just lose touch with those of us back home. Kathy, um, if resentment- show me, show me where you are. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm Great. sorry. Yes. Kathy, if resentment is the force that is tearing apart the state, we obviously have to understand the root causes of that resentment. If we were to remedy it, I would say that there are four causes, and I wonder if you could comment uh, on them and uh, the path we can take. The first is that politicians across the spectrum have abandoned talking about the common good. That was uh, the rallying cry in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. We were investing in the future when we invest in our children. We're investing in infrastructure because we're investing in, in a future society. That has been abandoned by both parties. Secondly, Starting with Ronald Reagan, it was an infantilization of the American voting public. The connection between taxes and services was broken. And people um, began to believe that there was no valid role for government at all uh, because of that, that, hey, give me my tax money back. It's I've got mine, forget about you. The third is perhaps a profound ignorance of economics. One can see this on postings on the local papers all the time. People have no clue what macroeconomics is. The government's team obviously has no clue what macroeconomics is. Um, but is, is, it, is it true or not that, in fact, many of the rural areas in Wisconsin, like many of the rural areas in Minnesota and the Dakotas until the, the fracking boom, are dying a slow economic uh, death? And the final point is that I've been in Wisconsin for 30 years. I have not seen either party ever articulate uh, a, a solution to the pressing problem facing the state, which is a constant fall in standards of living and income relative to other states. There has been no party that has put forward a platform that uh, is designed to, in fact, uh, lift up the state as a whole. And I wonder if you could comment on those four points that, as I, said, I believe, are driving the resentment. That if, you, if you're going to cure the resentment, you have to address those four points. Well, that was very well said. And um, it is hard to imagine how you have a thriving society without attention to the common good, without a willingness to pay for the things that we believe make for a great society without some understanding of economics. Um, how to remedy those things? It's a great question, I think. Um, really, I don't, I don't mean to say this lightly, but I think kind of exactly this, I think exactly people coming together be out of a concern for these trends out of a desire to see a different kind of a society and to question our politicians and ask Democratic Party, Republican Party, where have you been and what are you doing to reverse these trends? Why isn't Wisconsin the thriving economy that its neighbors are? So great first step and great for putting it out there. Okay. So. I have the microphone, I guess I'll talk. <laughs> um, so my question is, I mean, it seems like people believe things that just plain aren't true. I mean, the business of uh, getting fewer educational dollars, I, I think that Madison sends a lot more money out state to, out st uh, sorry, not out, I shouldn't say, rural area, it <laughs> small depends town, who you're talking to if it's uh, uh, school districts, then, then we get, you know, then we get, and how, I mean, why do they have this perception of things that just plain aren't true? Yeah. Well, let, let, can, can I show you a little bit of hard data on where resources go? Just because I think it helps to, to show why, even if some perceptions are inaccurate, why the overall perception that rural areas are not getting their fair share, where that might come from. So um, just bear with me. These, these are some bold charts and bar graphs. Um, 
This one is just showing federal expenditures in uh, 2010. Um, there are three different types of counties here. The rural counties are at the top. Uh, wait, no, let me explain this differently. Three different types of counties explained here. Rural counties are those um, in which the population um, doesn't does not contain a city that is between 10 and, and 50,000 people in population. Micropolitan counties are those in which there is a county of that middling size of a city, and the metropolitan counties are those that are um, basically in the Madison and Milwaukee metro area. What these bar charts are showing you are what portion of overall state aid is the bar closer to me, and what portion of federal expenditures in 2010 went to each of those different types of counties. You can look at that graph, and quickly see that, holy cow, a whole lot of money goes to metropolitan areas, right? However, you might say, well, that's where most people live, right? Fair point. So if you go to this graph, this is looking just at state aid, again in 2010, and, and the dots here are the 72 different counties in Wisconsin. And what this is showing you is the relationship between the percentage of rural folks in a county, so farther that way are more rural counties, closer toward me are more metro counties, or less rural, and then the, the axis going up and down is showing um, in, um, the thousands of dollars per capita spent in state expenditures. Basically, there's very little, no relationship, maybe a slightly positive relationship in terms of rural areas getting slightly a bit more. Not a very strong relationship though, I mean, the flat line. Here's federal aid, same kind of thing flat line, perhaps federal areas are getting a little bit more, not a whole lot more. But you might say, yeah, but okay, look at those, they're, not, they're not getting the short end of the stick. If anything, they're getting more than their fair short share. Well, bear with me for a little bit here. Um, this is looking at how much tax revenue is taken from each county by the state. Here you can see, it basically, again, same basic chart, Counties on that end are more rural, counties toward me are more metropolitan. Um, rural counties look like they're, they're putting in um, fewer state tax dollars to the pot, right? The same kind of thing goes for federal tax revenue, okay? But then, one thing I'm interested in is not just overall dollars, how many dollars come from each type of county, um, and th this is per capita again, but what's the return on those dollars? So per capita, of all the money put in per person, how much is given back per person? And so that's, this is, that's what I mean by percentage return from state taxes paid. Here it looks again, rural counties seem to fare pretty well, give, give perhaps a little bit more than their fair share. Same thing with respect to federal dollars, okay. If I stop there, I think a missing part of the story, though, and this part of the story is about the economic, overall economic conditions of rural areas compared to other counties in the state. So you can walk away from these charts and understandably say they're not getting their, the short end of the stick. But look at household income in rural counties, right? It's a whole lot less than in, in less rural counties. Um, Percentage below the poverty line, we tend to think of poverty as an urban issue. It's not. We have some significant poverty in rural counties in Wisconsin as well. And the unemployment rate. Um, you don't see, I mean, there's some rural areas, perhaps a little bit less than urban areas, but it's not a super strong relationship. So when you're a person in a rural county looking around you, what you see is not a thriving economy. Right, and what do you see of urban areas? If you're not spending a lot of time there, what do you see? Media, mediated images maybe? I mean news stories that sure may convey crime but may convey, you know, that's where industry is. That must be where the jobs are. And so I think hopefully that helps describe a little bit more where the perceptions are coming from. Please. Uh, kind of a historical question. Uh, this may not have come out of your data, but one of the things I wonder about is essentially how long has this been going on? How long have people in the rural areas felt as though they're getting the short end of the stick? Uh, do you have any sense of that from, from your data? 
To be honest, I don't really. I mean, I know over a five-year time span, and I didn't see a, a noticeable difference in that time span. I did, with the help of some great students, um, try to look back in local newspaper coverage in different communities around the state to try to get a picture of the way people perceive their rural economies over time, but really wasn't able to discern any big difference over time, either in the news coverage itself or in letters to the editor. So I don't have a great idea, but I know that there are some historians in the room who maybe have something to say. Well, pop up if you do, but, but great question. Sure, uh, there's time for two more questions, I'm told. So I'm not, whoever has a microphone next. Yes, please. Well, um, back to the University of Wisconsin, how does it feel being the last recipient of the Wisconsin IDEA grant? Oh, I'm not the last. There, there's- gonna get rid of it. Didn't Walker say he, was, he wanted to get rid of the Wisconsin oh. idea? Um, <laughs> well, yes, so the story goes. <laughs> yes, but how does it feel to be the recipient of a Wisconsin idea endowment grant? Fantastic. It feels fantastic to work at a place where there are hundreds if not thousands of people who do their jobs with an eye to the public good. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Please, please. Thank you. Uh, three, three quick things. Sure. Um, number one, thank you for your work. Uh, number two, when I left my house tonight, my daughter, my little girl said, make sure you say hi to everybody, Daddy. So hello to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hi. And, and finally, the you mentioned earlier that this kind of event is one way to start to address and work on the issues of resentment and uh, all of the issues that are out there that you've identified as far as income inequality and the real or perceived inequality of power. And I agree with you 100%, but my concern with that is that we are all sitting in a very blessed place. Yeah. We sit in the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, Mortgage Institute for Research in Madison, and doing something like this in other places around the state, and not even La Crosse or Wausau or places that are smaller cities, but yeah. you know the the proverbial coffee shop, if you will, in yeah. Athens, Wisconsin, or wherever it is. Those are the kinds of things that it seems like would be another step of this. Is there a role for the University of Wisconsin, both Madison, the system schools, and the extension in taking this beyond this one place that Scott Walker would be very easy to point to and say those liberals and their ideas, and be continue that dialogue between urban and rural and, and all of the other things that are being pitted against each other mm -hmm. to try to find some common good, as the gentleman mentioned earlier. What role can the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and as a whole, take in doing that? That's a great question. Yes. Yes, I think the answer is yes. You've just given me a great idea. I mean, I've been thinking about how do I hand deliver a copy of my book to all these people I spent time with. I am feeling the need to go back and check in with them, and see what they're talking about, and also give them a copy or more of my book. and. Maybe there's a way to somehow create forums around those visits that doesn't draw attention to their community if they don't want it. But I agree with you that I think gathering people together like this does so many things and it shares ideas, but it also, I don't know about you, but it's so hopeful to me to see this room packed full of people who are concerned about this issue. I know it's not me. Most of you don't know who I am or if I'm a decent public speaker or not. You care about this state and about what's going on here. And that sentiment, um, yeah, someone could point a finger at this place and this gathering and call it a bunch of liberals, but this sentiment, it's not unique to Madison. There's people all around the state who are concerned about the way, the direction we're headed. So thank you for the idea. Thank you.
so be before we thank Kathy once again, I just want to make another plug for letting us know if you want to attend more of these kinds of lectures and more activities um, aimed at connecting us. So please give us your name somehow. You can text 22333, text us your email, or sign up. Um, and with that, if you could just help me thank Kathy one more time. I hope to see you next month.